Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest on the line, Erica Ford. Welcome back. Peace. How's everybody doing today? How you doing? Bless black and highly favored, Queen. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, Queen. I'm good. Now, for people that don't know, you're the co-founder of the Life Camp Pain Incorporated. Life Camp, I should say, Incorporated, where you do the job. You do what you got to do. You're in those hoods. You're trying to get those guns off the streets. You're uh, trying to make sure these uh, gang members and people that are beefing squash their beefs. You do the work, and we appreciate you so much. I want to start and she's been doing that. this for a very long time, very by long the way. Time. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, this weekend, uh, last week, Friday, I think, you, you, went out, you, you drove down to D.C.? No, we drove right through the camera into the Zoom box. <laughs> so you Zoom box. I thought I got a chance to actually sit with them. Okay, I'm not mad at that. I've, I've been all over the world in a week, you know? <laughs> so what happened with your meeting with Joe Biden? So we met with Ambassador Rice, uh-huh. um, Susan Rice, who is the head of, of um, public affairs, domestic policy. She used to be the ambassador under Obama. And so we met with her about putting $5 billion into gun violence prevention, into community safety work. We know that Joe Biden made the call to put 900 million, but 900 million across the cities uh, is not enough. And so we we talked to her about that. We talked to her about the urgency, about the number of people who are dying in the streets to gun violence in co-relationship to coronavirus and the gun violence epidemic. It's all the same people in the same communities. And so if we talk about I can't breathe, we need to put oxygen into that community and that's direct resources and support. Were they receptive to your message? She was very receptive to the message. Um, she was very receptive. And she said that she you know, wanted information on why Five billion, as opposed to the nine hundred million, and so we put that together and we sent it. She also wanted to, you know, um, she she feels that she's a strong advocate for this, and she knows how to do intergovernmental stuff. And this is what it is. It's about all the agencies working together. So she will committed to be a champion for this, and so we just got to see you know, stuff like that bothers me because it's like you asking for five billion to put into a, a, a gun violence prevention and they asking questions. I bet you they don't ask the NYPD why they need six billion. Right. And that's six billion in New York City alone. Just New York, exactly. We're talking about five billion across the United States, which is totally not enough money, but would be a great start. Um and you're absolutely right. Um but you know, the process. I'm not going to get caught up in the process. I want to get caught up in the victory. I want to get the oxygen to the people and and we're going to see what they do. You know, we can only see what they do. They, you know, that's, that's, but we're not going to be quiet and just stand alongside and wait till what they do. We are, you know, going to organize the community and make the call to fund peace, you know. People- I know you have the peace mobile too, which I love. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's why I said you drove yeah. up there. I thought for sure you drove the Peace Mobile the to Washington, Mobile. D.C. Yeah, I thought for sure that was in, so, in D.C. So, so she, she, one of her statements was, I would love to come to New York and, and connect with Erica and see the word, but coronavirus. So I said to her, my quick response, I can drive the Peace Mobile to D.C. <laughs> and we can make it happen. And so the Peace Mobile is a 35-foot RV and where we mobilize peace, we... We take it to communities where incidents of violence happen. We give young people and families and communities the opportunity to come on and experience healing, whether it's going into the studio, putting pain on beats, whether it's punching the punching bag, whether it's sitting down and doing healing circles, or just learning how to eat more alkaline than acidic. You know, we definitely, along with a lot of other folks, have made healing and therapeutic services cool in the hood. And that's what it's all about is, is, is choosing the opportunity to heal then pick up that gun and shoot somebody or commit an act of violence. Absolutely. Erica, why, what, what, what doesn't Joe Biden get in regards to defunding the police? You know what? I think most people got stuck on. So first of all, a lot of people don't like you to tell you what to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he, he I think that a lot of old the, white the, men, let's be clear on that. A lot of old white men, but a lot of black men too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't want to see 
defund the police are words that they didn't create, mm -hmm. right? Because the concept of defund anything, they do it all the time. That's right. Immediately, they That's defund right. education. They defund youth services. They defund health care and Medicaid and all kinds of things for people in the lower um, epsilon of communities, right? But when people call for their own oxygen mask, when their own self-determination, people have an offense to that, which is totally wrong. If we look at the, the 0.001% of every dollar that the New York City crisis management system gets in correlation to the $6 billion that the police get, then we do, the, we do more than what they can do. And so they have to shift dollars from the hammer, from the criminalization, from the incarceration, from killing innocent children across America and put it into peace, put it into helping people heal. And when we say peace, we're not talking about we standing around and turning the other cheek. We talking about helping our people heal. We've been experiencing generational trauma mm -hmm. and we have to heal from that shit. We've come from slavery, never have we even the playing field. And so when people talk about reparations and defund the police, it's all they talking about is putting resources in the hands of the people who need the resources. You know. Right, because a lot of times I see the solution is we need more police on the streets, you know, coming from uh, <laughs> people in positions of power politically. Even just recently, there's been a lot of issues on the subway system in New York City. We saw somebody punched a two year old in the face repeatedly. We saw there's been all kinds of things happening on the train. Like we got to put more police in the train stations. But what's the real solution? Like where, what's the oxygen for that? I think that we need to put more violence interrupters, more credible messages in communities, more therapeutic services in communities so that we can help people from the front. We respond to situations before 911 calls are made. And that's why we are able to interrupt more violence. You know, when we look at New York City, we had the success of a whole week with nobody being killed, right? We had the whole weekend with nobody being shot. That's history in New York City. Mm -hmm. The police have always been here. So we have to look at what is the different dynamic that came into the equation. And it is us, the brothers and sisters from Man Up and Street Corner Resources and SOS and Life Cam and all of those groups who are now working with the people who have the highest potential to be in these incidents of violence and working directly with them. And that's what is needed, you know? So if you put more resources into what works as opposed to getting stuck on a conversation about defund police, you gotta put money in what works. You have to put money in what works. And that's what we're saying. The mayor said he's gonna double the New York City crisis management system in the next thing. We need the governor to do the same thing. We need governors and mayors across the, the state to do the same thing. We need people to call their governors and mayors and ask them for these things. And not at more police, but more resources. Let's all fund peace. So, you know, we're making a campaign telling people to text fund peace to 51555, mm -hmm. fund peace, and, and join the movement, and let's make this a reality across the nation. Now, in your opinion, how would you say that we get more of these guns off the streets? You know, because it has to be from the root, of course. So what would you do to make sure we get more of these guns off the street and out of the hands of some of these young young kids? Um, white supremacists are bringing guns across America, you know, and so... That is a federal thing that they have to stop on a federal level. In our hood, we have to stop people from wanting to pick a gun up. We have to stop them from wanting to look at a gun because I, I can't really waste my time, MV, and I'm very serious on trying to find out where all the guns are because I'll never find that out, right? right? But what I can do is make you not want to use that gun as a, a remedy, right? When my friends died, when my friends got killed and shot, I started to do something different 30 years ago, mm. 30 years ago, right? Mm. And so the, the DA would ask me, why don't you turn that person in that's got a gun? I said, because if I turn that person in that's got a gun, that's one gun. That's one gun you get off the street. But if I change that man's lifestyle and I change what he's doing and make him do something, then his whole crew would be changed. And so that's why we partnered with the Bloods and the Crips, right? And so we're doing a whole campaign on unifying gangs, 
on unifying what they're doing and changing the method of operation as opposed to, you know, that's white people's job. Stop white people from putting guns all over America. You know, that's a whole nother thing. You know, Eric, I want to talk about the trauma that comes from gun violence. Is it possible to beat or even face that type of trauma without the help of therapy? And and, and what are the outcomes and, and, and what are the, the leading routines to heal from, from gun violence? You, you have to get therapy. And the, the, with us, the process is how do we get them to therapy? Because a lot of them look at therapy as being punkish or not cool, et cetera, et cetera. And so we do unconventional things um, to help young people and adults accept therapy um, just by having conversations with each other, just by, you know, we do a lot of meditation. We have uh, urban yogis program that we started with Deepak Chopra, right? With the young people who came from the Supreme team, you know, in Bayesley projects. And so by their behavior, they shifted the narrative of making therapy and meditation and all of those healing tools cool. And so then young people started to do it. But the things that you're doing in terms of making it cool is definitely what is needed. The, the, the whole idea of being about peace and being about healing is not yet reached the, the thermometer level of cool, mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to make young people open up to want to sit down and have a conversation. And we got to train people who are culturally competent to do this. And so we are right. definitely recruiting healers, um, therapists, social workers who are about people um, uh, to join us in this campaign. We definitely need to put an army of social workers and therapists out we go out as much as we can, but we need more. Cultural you know, competence uh, is the key. I mean, it's only I think we only make up like three or four percent of all mental health care workers. Yes, we have to train more mental health workers. We have to, you know. Yeah, Erica, as you said, you've been doing this work for over 30 years. I want to ask you, what's the difference in how you're received now versus when you first started when it comes to the police department, when it comes to the mayor, and even when it comes to the people that you're servicing? Yo, so that's a funny question. Um, definitely back then, um, I I remember like Fat Joe used to always go, oh, here she come with that black shit again, you know? <laughs> here she go again. I was like, oh, you know? And everybody, my friends, all of them would say the same thing. Here she go again. Here she go again. But now, this is the conversation of the world. And so I'm the popular one now because, yo, that's my friend. That's my friend. That's my, you know? And so, and then the police uh, and the different, it, it took us a while to get them to even want to listen to accept this whole system in New York City and, uh, and the White House right now, right? It took that those years of work, people putting in that work to pick up that phone, to get that conversation. And then of course, the people in the street, we've been in the street for those 30 years. And so it gets a level of respect and ability so that when we say to the police, like we've done, like get all of your police out of here or stop arresting this guy or interrupt a situation, they'll listen. They literally stop and listen and we are able to have a conversation and negotiate that person not being arrested or that house not being raided. We've done that. On the 4th of July, the kids were shooting fireworks at the police. They were getting ready to call in backup and all the things. The commander called my chief of streets and he was like, what are we gonna do? He was like, remove your police, I got the kids. And so they removed all of the police. The police didn't want to leave, but they had to because they got that directive. And we were able to intervene on people getting arrested, people getting shot, and all over New York City, they, the shootings was up that weekend. In our area, there was no shootings, right? And wow. so we were able to, to, to negotiate on a different level because of the years of, of respect that we have. You know, I think that's important because there are a lot of people who are now like, OK, this is a great time for us to get funding for this or starting this program. But you have been doing this for so long. So there is a level of trust that people from both sides have with you because of the consistency that you had. And you've been at it since before it was popular. Correct. Correct. You couldn't even say black power. That whole black life. You couldn't say those things. You were ostracized, blackballed. You know, except I've been blackballed. Definitely. You know, um, and so. The consistency drives success as well, you know, um, and it's hard work because a lot of times what you do is not sexy. So you don't get the funding. You don't get the, you know, the different accolades and to be in different spotlights and stuff. 
to, and you have to be there because you have to raise the, the, the knowledge of what you're doing and the work so that people can support it and people can come to it. Because a lot of young people are looking for a way out and we have to let them know that there is a way out. You know, there is How do people donate to the Life Camp Incorporated, Erica? LifeCampInc.com. They can go to LifeCampInc.com and, and donate to Life Camp. Life Camp on all social media platforms. Life Camp Cash App, Life Camp Venmo, Life Camp um, everything. All right. Well, Erica, we appreciate you for joining us. And, you know, anything that you're doing, anytime you're doing anything, please let us know. Keep us Definitely. abreast of what you're doing. Thank you, Thank you right. very Thank much, you. Queen. Erica Ford is The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Yeah.